What's going on guys, it's Matty Ice. Welcome back to the Hush Life Podcast. This week is a special one. Casey, Logan, Bryce, and I are in the backcountry Nevada hunting mule deer. This podcast takes place as Casey and I are hiking out after nine days in the backcountry. I hope you enjoy it and make sure to leave a review, a like, or a subscribe on whichever podcasting platform you are listening to. Thanks guys, enjoy the show. Well, hello everybody. Um, first of all, welcome back to the Hush Life Podcast. It's been a minute since uh, I've been on the podcast. We always say we're going to be more consistent with the podcast, but um, we're trying, trying our best. But we are going to do something ne- that's never been done before, right, Matt? Never been done. We are hiking out of the backcountry of Nevada right now. I, this is Casey, and then we got Maddie Lee behind me. Um, unfortunately, we got Logie Bear and my buddy Bryce on horses in front of us. They are not gonna, going to be able to attend the podcast because we don't have enough lav mics for them. Um, in, anyway, so Matt bought these new lav mics to try to get some better audio for our videos. And we've got about a two and a half mile hike out of here. Uh, and Maddie said, Still, do you want to do a podcast? I'm like, let's throw those lobs on and do a podcast while we're hiking out of here. So hopefully this goes well. But like I was saying, we've been in the backcountry of Nevada for this is eight, day number nine, right? Yep, day number nine. Day number nine. So me and Maddie came in here um, two days before the season opened. And we backpacked in. And uh, we had... Me, myself, and my buddy Bryce, who's on the horse, who's not attending the podcast, had mule deer, archery mule deer tags in our pocket. And, uh, yeah, so we came up here to the high country of Nevada, like I said, and uh, hunted. And we had, I would say, pretty amazing experience up here. As a whole, it was an amazing experience. And we had some amazing adventures along the way. Um, just to kind of set the scene, if you guys watched Best Season Yet 2, I believe that was 2019, we opened the season off with this hunt where we all rode horses back in here. It was just me, Logie, and Bryce at that time and set up a camp and hunted deer for, I think it was like seven or eight days, three years ago as well. So we did the same thing this year, except for I wanted to come over here a little earlier just to scout um, and see where the deer were hanging out. And then me and Maddie packed in and then the Logie and Bryce came in on the horses a couple days later, which is nice because, uh, when you're backpacking, you really rely on subpar food for the most part. Um, when I say subpar, it's not terrible. It's just dehydrated food and snacks. But when the horses come in, uh, we pre-made some frozen meals. And so you're able to eat a little better. But me and Maddie did most, uh, mostly we did a lot of backpacking, right? Yeah, man. We spent more time away from camp than we did at main camp, I think. So we hunted for uh, two days and found some success day two with Bryce on a freaking awesome buck. Um, Me and Maddie were able to spot him first thing in the morning. And uh, kind of coached Bryce in onto where he was at. And it was, I can't, I don't know when this is going to come out. I'm assuming before the hunt, but um, you, I can't wait for you guys to watch the footage. It was one of the coolest stocks, well performed by Bryce. And this the shot uh, he, he had of the buck when he came out of his bed was absolutely remarkable. Well, let's talk about it, Matt. When I say bed, what am I talking about? Yeah, so just picture the coolest cliff subalpine basin you've ever seen. And picture five bucks climbing in a cave. And then an archer, an archery hunter standing about 20 yards above them on top of the cave roof, basically. Just get that as a visual. And that's kind of what we're talking about. Yeah, if you've ever hunted... uh high country mule deer with your bow. I would say it was one of those situations that everyone that's ever tried to 
stick an arrow into a uh, mule deer up in the high country dreams of. You know, you always want to find a bedded buck, um, especially a bedded buck that's somewhat in the open so you can kind of keep eyes on them while you're making your stock. And then once you get close, you have enough terrain to um, hide yourself well enough to get close enough to make a good shot. Well, imagine a buck in a cliff or in a cave and you stalking in above him, which takes away all of his senses for the most part. He has no vision because you're up behind him on a cliff. He has very little smell, sense, or scent. Um, would you say what would you say the wind is doing in a cave? I think the wind is pretty stagnant. I mean, he'd probably be getting thermals on that hillside coming from down below him up into the cave. Yeah. But he ultimately has no advantage of somebody being above him with those thermals, let alone above him while he's in a cave. Yeah, because you think about even if the wind would have been blowing, so Bryce was above him on the cliff, even if the wind would have been blowing straight at his back towards the cave, I don't believe that scent's going to go off that rock face and then back into the cave. Like it's just going to go over the top of him. Anyway, so definitely a scenario I've dreamed of while I was hunting deer with my bow. Um, and it was just absolutely perfect. It was a great team effort for me and Maddie spotting him to guiding Bryce in with a lot of frantic hand signals, things like that. Um, and the buck fed out just like, like he read the, the playbook, fed out and Bryce made an absolute perfect shot on him and uh, killed him. Great buck, uh, beautiful, beautiful velvet buck. Yeah, it's kind of cool. We saw that buck the first night we came in here, and he was kind of the number two hitless buck at the time. We instantly named him like Mr. Krabs, and we were able to watch him. Hold on one sec, Matt. I'm not sure if you can hear this, but let me set, I didn't really paint the picture very well for, for you. Like I said, we're in the high country. We were hiking down a trail, a horse trail or a hiking trail. Um, and, and we're just leaving the big basin and where we had camped and hunted at for the most part. Uh, sun's just going down behind the big, big mountain to our left. Uh, the trail is on the right side and there's a creek running down beside us. And it's, the sun has gone down, like I said, we're in the shade, it's absolutely gorgeous. It smells beautiful. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear that creek because that will set, set uh, the scene for you real quick. Should have done that first, but um, anyway, sorry, Matt. Where was that? Oh yeah, so we had saw this buck the first night we came in here, the following morning, and then the following evening. So we saw him three times before the hunt even opened. So we had a pretty good idea of what this buck was doing, but like Casey said, just to paint the picture, we came in two days early and uh, it's pretty miraculous to see how much of an impact humans and just activity around the basins make on the deer's habits. We saw, what was it, 25 bucks the first day and a half of scouting, and then another camp moved in, and that number dwindled down to six to seven bucks really quick. Yeah, it's interesting because, like I said, this is a, this is a main hiking trail, basically. A lot of people, a lot of traffic in the summertime. People hiking it to go up into the basin, go to a lake, whatever they might be doing. And so you think maybe the deer are kind of used to that all summer long. But um, we definitely saw things change. When me and Maddie got in here, like I said, two days before, we were the only ones in the basin. There was no hikers, no campers, no hunters. It was just us and uh, at our base camp. And yeah, like Maddie said, there was the morning before the opener, we went up onto our high point that we usually glass. And there was one morning, 25 bucks in one basin. And I was pretty, we're pretty stoked on the idea of the opener because there was so many, it was target rich environment. So let's kind of break down 
What kind of, this is my favorite part of podcast. What kind of gear are we taking up to the glassing knobs case? Up to the glassing knobs? Yep, so we leave camp. So we leave obviously like our tent, sleeping bag, pad, additional food and water. Yeah, so we basically have a base camp set up of what me and Matt packed in at the time. Um, and uh, plus all of our hunting gear and two days worth of food when we came in. So basically we leave camp right before, you know, first light. And it's only 15, 20 minute hike if that to uh, one of the glassing knobs we use. So basically we just take enough food and water, food and snacks for the morning. And then um, the gear we like to use up here is, this is definitely a, a spotter friendly environment. If you like to glass or you're pretty efficient at glassing, um, this hunts for you. Any, I would say any or most high country deer hunts are that way because that's basically what you're doing is you're trying to locate deer and uh, watch them until they're in, in an ideal place to go put a stock on. So it's glass heavy. So what I took, what I'm using is I've got a pair of the Vortex Razor UHD 10 by 50s. Um, and then I've got a what was our spotter? Our Vortex Razor 65 UHD. 65 UHD. And then I was using a Vortex, what's my tripod? Summit Carbon. Summit Carbon. It's our new one that just came out. Super light. Summit Carbon uh, tripod with a Manfrotto head on it. And I had the Vortex Bino adapter. And this is what I'm going to tell you. If you like to glass a lot with binos, um, especially if you're glassing long distances, like what's called for up here. You know, we were spotting a lot of these deer from, you know, a lot of them would be a mile or less, but we got on a lot of bucks that were over two miles, you know, up to two and a half, three miles away. Tri or binos on a tripod is dangerous, is what Matt says. It is next level glassing. It's real dangerous because... I think humans as a predator, one of our biggest um, assets is our, obviously our vision. And I think just like many predators, we really key in on movement. And when you have a tripod that your binoculars are on, that eliminates your natural movement by just holding the binos. So you're able to detect like an ear flicker or tail flick way, way more efficiently than free handing binoculars. Plus, is the amount of hours we've spent up here the last nine days glassing, a tripod just takes all that strain out of your arms or however you like to glass because it's on a tripod. And you're just more efficient because not only can you see better, you're way more stable, but you're able to glass longer because you're not straining your arms or whatever, what have you, trying to hold your binos up or putting your, you know, even putting your elbows on your knees or whatever you do, binos on a tripod just relieves all that. So not only while you're glassing, you're more efficient, you're more efficient because you're able to glass longer. I agree with that. And I think like number one thing that has made me a better glasser is taking like a good butt pad and then spending two or three minutes to kick out a little glassing bed and then really adjusting my tripod to where, where, where I'm sitting comfortably, I can look through the glass. So there's no strain in my neck or my back or anything like that. So what I like to do with my tripod is the two legs. So I put one leg out 12 o'clock and that's gonna be the longest leg at the steepest angle. And then the back two legs, I have kicked out on about like a 70 or 80 degree angle. And uh, that way it can straddle my body basically so those binos are right up, right up above my lap, basically. And that's kind of optimal for me is instead of having all three legs pitched at the same angle out in front of me to where I have to lean forward, I kind of have it pitched at a wider angle back on top of my lap so I can sit relaxed. And then a butt pad just enhances everything, I swear. So if you can't visualize what, what he's saying, grab your tripod and just sit in your living room or wherever you're at and just put those legs down all the same level because obviously, hopefully your living room floor is level, but um, your put your tripod in front of you 
and see if that's comfortable to, if you had a pair of binos on top of it to look through. What he's saying is, in, you wanna set your tripod up in a way that you're not leaning forward or straining your neck forward to get your binos to your eyes. If you do it right, how Matt just explained, you can literally sit on a butt pad, have your back up against your backpack or a rock, and those binos are right there in your eyes. You're not straining to move to look at them or anything like that. But yeah, I would say that tip, Matt, is that a tip, a tech tip? Yeah, a tech tip. And, and something else, like people say this about when they're setting their peep sight or their rifle scope, get that, those binoculars where they feel comfortable, close your eyes and then open your eyes. And if those binoculars aren't in a clear view, like you can see clearly through them, you need to adjust something because if you're not perfectly relaxed, then it's just like, just little things add up over seven to 10 days, you know? Oh yeah, I think even little things add up after, you know, like I said, if you do it right and you have the right equipment to sit in glass, like little things add up after, you know, if you're on the glassing and on for three or four hours, they add up after a little bit. You, your back's not strained, your butt's not sore, sitting on rocks. And I, I'll, I'll admit, I'm the guy that gets up to the glassing knob, dumps all my gear as quick as, I, as possible, grabs my tripod, throws the binos on there, and just starts glassing just because I'm so excited to see what's there. But if you just take a little time, not even five minutes, a couple minutes, get everything right, sit down, you can sit there for hours and be more efficient while you're on the glassing knob and most likely find more deer. Yeah, I would say 90% of the deer we saw, 90% of the shooter bucks we saw were seated on bino binos on a tripod, and we found those deer at like non-optimal times. Like not first light or last light, I would say. So they were more of a technical grinding out glassing session versus just pull up to a basin and be like, oh, there's a group of deer. Yeah, I think um, the, the allure of high country mule deer hunting for me has always been, and uh, I used to watch, DVDs, movies, read articles, read books about guys hunting high country muleys in Nevada, Colorado, wherever it might be. And the allure to me was always that depending on what country you're hunting, um, above tree line, uh, big basins, typically maybe the deer aren't always on their feet, but if you glass hard enough, a lot of times these deer are bedding in areas or places that you will be able to spot them all day long because this time of year, they don't have, they have velvet on and they don't really want to go into thick timber just because that velvet's sensitive. And so that what they do is they just go out and lay in a, in a place in the basin that they're out of the sunlight for the most part. And so the sun changes all day long and maybe you don't glass up something first off or in midday, but when that sun gets up high enough, that, that shade line changes. And so that deer has to get up and ch change with the ch shade line. And so if you spend enough time glassing, you will see deer if you're looking in the right spots. Yeah, you kind of just chase those little shade pockets and you'd be amazed at how many deer you'll pick up just by being patient. And this happened, so the biggest buck we saw all trip was actually one I glassed over the top of three to five times. Like, I don't know if the scale was off, I mean, we were glassing almost three miles away and I glassed over the top of these deer three to five times. And then Casey goes, oh dude, there's a deer. I think it's a buck from like almost three miles away. And he explained to me where it was. And I was like, son of a gun. I glassed right over the top of that three to five times. So just because you don't see a deer at first doesn't mean that deer's not there. So what I do a lot of times is I'll glass something like left to right then I'll go back right to left, and then I'll go top to bottom, bottom to top. Kind of just grid it. Think of it like mowing a lawn, trying to impress your neighbors. Really just cover that country the best you can. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there have been articles. and uh, Dude, the guy that name that comes to mind is Mike Duplon. He wrote some books and used to write for Eastman, but he used to have, or I read this article, or, or some sort of literature he wrote about and he described his, his pattern, his glassing pattern. And he would sit down at a knob or wherever he was glassing from. And he would kind of pick out the stuff that was a long ways away first. Or no, the stuff that was close first. 
in case like the deer saw him or whatever. But he was pick, he was looking for the easy stuff, right? Looking for the bucks that were out or the deer that were out or close to him. Once he realized that uh, they weren't there, or maybe he saw one, he started this pattern or this grid in order to cover all the country that he could possibly see. Uh, it's a pretty interesting read, but like Maddie was saying, a good way to look at it is mowing your lawn. You wanna cover, you're not gonna just mow your lawn and then have a bunch of strips in the middle, hopefully you don't, but uh, all the grass will be cut. And if you glass correctly, all the country should be covered for the most part. But like he said, it reminds me very similar to like spring bear hunting. You can sit on a knob and glass for bears for hours on end and think there's no bears in the country. Then all of a sudden you glass a place or a section that you've glassed numerous times and all of a sudden there's a bear stand, standing there. Deer are very similar to bear in this time, this time of year where they could just be laying behind a rock, laying on the edge of some bushes. They love the willows. They could be laying right in the middle of the willows and never see them. And then they stand up or they you know, get up to move for the shade line and there they are. Uh, my breathing heart is because we're going down very technical. Was this technical, Matt? Yeah, this is a... A this ankle breaker right here. Let's compare it to skiing. It's, it's not a double black diamond, but maybe single? I wouldn't even say that. So anyway, um, yeah, it's interesting when you get out and start doing this more and more. This is the third time I've had this tag in probably the last, I don't know, six years. And uh, we used to do a high country deer hunt up in Utah every year. The whole Hush crew was kind of the way we kicked off the season. And um, it was just tough because where we were hunting, there were still big basins and stuff, which you're looking for. But there was also some thick timber up there. And for whatever reason, those deer up there, when we started hunting it, they didn't want us to just lay out in the basin like behind a rock. They just wanted to go to the thick timber. So it made it pretty difficult. So all those things we just explained about, you know, this time of year, deer want to be up high in a basin, bedded behind a rock, following the shade line. It just wasn't that way when we hunted up in Utah. So coming up here is fun because it's like, if you if you've ever thought about high country mule deer hunting, this is, I would say this is like the epitome of it where these deer kind of act like you think they should, which is kind of funny because we always, as humans think, you know, whatever we're hunting, like, oh, there should be elk here. There's wallows, there's feed, there's bedding. And animals just do at the end of the day, really what they want according to their senses, uh, you know, they obviously need any food, water, shelter, but they do it in a certain pattern or certain, you know, way to suit them because they're animals and we're, we're humans. Yeah, man, something that comes to mind when you're talking about kind of where a deer wants to live, this is something that I've been able to kind of take note of, not only on public land, but private land. So areas that are tough to get to, or areas that are tough to access because they're private, where a deer is at in June, July, early August, before there's any pressure, is basically that deer's prime area that he wants to live. He feels safest there. He feels most comfortable there. He's closest to feed, good feed, water source, because deer are pretty lazy in the velvet. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have noticed Glassing for deer in the summertime, you go back week after week or day after day, if you're not bumping those deer, they're not moving more than about a quarter mile to half a mile if they're in some good feed. So that's kind of something I really have taken to heart on tactics, the way I hunt mule deer. If I find a deer in July and August, weather permitting, I strongly, strongly believe that deer is gonna live there as long as he can. Whether that be October to November, I've killed deer and hunted deer. Loud Creek crossing, sorry. I've spotted and killed deer in November within a hundred yards of where I first see them in June and July. And I know that kind of differs on most places, but the type of terrain I'm talking, subalpine basins with a little more jack pines and quakies than you would think, rather than just a barren basin. And I, I have seen it time and time again to where wherever that deer is living, summertime is his number one choice of habitat to call home. So if you guys ever get in an area where you think 
man, I've seen this big buck three or four times, but it's two or three weeks later. I think he's moved out of here. Before you bounce and just bail on that place, really do due diligence of glassing that several times. Deer kind of change their patterns based on moon phases, temperature, weather, all kinds of things. But I strongly believe mule deer want to stay where they're comfortable. And as long as they're not getting a whole lot of pressure, I don't think they're moving very far. I would say, you know, in comparison to, you know, some other creatures we hunt, like let's talk about elk, for example. I feel like elk, for the most part, let's look at their, their uh, life pattern or, you know, a, a, a year in the life of a bull elk, okay? We'll talk about spring. Spring, they're usually pulling up, depending on where you're at, they pull up out of the migration or where they had migrated to to spend the winter. So they're pulling up out of there and they're going up into the high country or up into some thick timber where they can escape the temperatures for the most part, you know, in the summer months. And so they might be a little higher. And then August, September rolls around. Those bulls are pulling down for the most part, pulling down off the the top of the higher country to come and find the females. And when they find the females, they rut all over, right? They kind of have some rutting grounds they like, open, big open parks, meadows, wallows are important, all those things. Well, then once the rut hit ends, especially a big mature bull, Big mature bull will get beat up, man. After the rut, I, I can't remember the numbers, but I can't remember how much body fat they actually they lose during the rut, but it's a lot. They're pretty beat up, and the only way that thing's gonna survive is if they go into a little hidey hole and recover. And what I've always found is a big bull elk, after the rut, especially he was the guy leading the charge for most of the time, he's gonna go to a place that requires very little effort out of him to get food, water, shelter. So then after that happens, the big bull elk, when it starts snowing, winter comes, they'll pull down for the most part. There are some big bulls that will stay up on some high ridges and wind blown ridges where they can get food and stuff to recover. But most of the time they pull down into that migration. That's kind of the year in the life of a big bull elk, in my opinion. Matt, would you agree with that? I agree with like 99% of that. I think the only thing, wow. Well, I guess it's not really a disagreement, but once that rut starts, based on some studies I've read of collared elk, I strongly believe that uh, those lead cows, those 16 to 18 year old cows, because that's how long some of those older cows will live, they are basically the most intelligent, smartest ones, and they are just pulling that elk herd away from pressure keeping them in a comfortable zone. And basically, I think from our perspective, a lot of times we think the bull elk are kind controls of- Controls Yeah, controls the herd or steers the herd. I think he's really just trying to pet, play rancher, you know, just trying to keep his cows away from other bulls. And he's basically just being a ranch dog, keeping other bulls and things away from his cows. But yeah, man, it's spot on. And I really think mule deer are very similar in a lot of ways that, uh, like you said, um, springtime, just somewhere they're comfortable, out of some hotter temperatures, and then come rut time, obviously, wherever those does are. I mean, yeah. you see that all the time, end of October, first of November, trying to find does when you're hunting those big mule deer. You're like, just checking up on that herd of does every day, because you know, any day now, a big buck's gonna come in, or even a bigger buck's gonna come kick another buck off the herd. So I think it has a lot of similarities. Well, and I would say this, this is some of the best advice I could give you guys at home. We get this question a lot, asked a lot, like, hey, what am I looking for when I go out scouting for my elk hunt come September? And it might be, you know, June, July, even August. I'd say it's cool to find a big bull, there's no doubt about it. And look for big bulls when you're out, but if you're scouting for a bull elk hunt, that starts during the rut, and you want to be the most efficient with your time, I'd go and look for the bigger populations of cows. And once you find them, you know the bulls are going to be down there first of, 
end of August, 1st of September, snooping around, seeing if those elk are in heat or if there's a cow in heat. And then after that, you know, that lead cow will take that herd wherever. Same with mule deer, man. If you have a late season mule deer tag um, and you want to go scout for it, even scouting in like September, October, uh, yeah, look for where the does are at and know where, you know, some habitual breeding grounds are because I feel like mule deer and elk are the same way. They like to go to the same place year after year to breed. And you usually find them in those same places unless they get pressure. But uh, let's talk about some of the challenges we faced on this hunt, man. We talk about it, we always talk about it going into a hunt, like what are some challenges or some roadblocks that we might face and how are we gonna get around them to be, find the most success that we can. So what would be the number one roadblock you saw? Maybe, yeah, because before coming in here, what, 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 in your head, you've never been up here. You've hunted a lot of deer in your life, guided a lot of guys into some big deer. Your perspective of coming into this hunt, knowing a little bit about it, what, what would you say was in your head as one of the roadblocks we were gonna have to overcome? Well, two jump out to me. Number one being mule deer are just pretty damn hard to get into bow range. Yeah. And that's first and foremost, no matter where you're at. And second of all, just some additional pressure from hikers or hunters. I mean, I love seeing it. I honestly love seeing other hunters out and about. And specifically this hunt, we ran into some really, really respect respectable stand-up dudes. They were very courteous. We communicated with them. And I think that's the way to go about it on these public lands. If you're hunting the same kind of mountain range, same basins, you know, don't be afraid to communicate and just be like, hey man, like we've been seeing a buck here. I would love to be able to hunt the basin all to myself today. And if you're cool with that, maybe you can hunt it tomorrow kind of thing. That way you're not just button heads and working against each other. It's hard enough to find a deer and find a deer in a killable spot. But then when you have another dude trying to foot race you to it, it just makes the whole thing no fun for anybody. So number top two challenges, Additional pressure from other hunters and hikers, and then, dude, mule deer, big mature mule deer. I'm talking that six to eight year old buck. They have that sixth sense, man, and I know that gets thrown around pretty loosely, but I strongly believe they have something that, I mean, it's, it's no coincidence that they live to be seven to 10, 12 years old with all the mountain lions, winters, hunters, all the technology nowadays. No coincidence those deer are alive and they're not dumb. Yeah, they've been around the block. Um, just go back to what you were talking about with running into other hunters. I think that's super key to talk about. Just because, you know, it happens. It always, it's always going to happen. It always has happened. Um, what I absolutely hate to see is, you know, two hunters, obviously, hopefully anyway, out trying to accomplish the same goal make some memories, kill, kill a buck, put some meat in the freezer. Like 99.9% .9 of the people out here with tags in their pocket are trying to do just that. And I've seen it in the past where you get that competitive guy or the competitive group of guys that see, you know, see another hunter in their basin or headed to their basin. And they're the guys that are running, trying to get in front of them or, you know, blowing stocks for people, whatever you might have. And that just sucks, like, it's just silly. And I can say that I'm just not that guy. Like, I don't wanna come out here in the woods and be competitive with anybody except for myself. Like, I wanna challenge myself, I wanna work hard, and I wanna to try to, you know, do those two things of harvest a buck and put meat in the freezer. But communication goes a long ways anywhere, not just out in the woods, but especially out here, like Matt said, and we did it a handful of times. We had guys either come into a basin that we were glassing or headed a direction that we were gonna head. And all we had to do is go and talk to them, kind of let them know our plans and let us know their plans. And then we just kind of stayed out of each other's way. And that's honestly, if you're trying to be efficient in the woods, that's the way to do it. I've walked up on guys literally 40, 50 yards away walking over to talk to him and they just bail off the ridge like they don't care what I'm doing. They're going to do their thing no matter what. When in reality, if they would have just let me know like, hey, we've been up here, you know, all morning long, got a buck bedded. 
or this is kind of the basin we hunt, I'm sweet. I'll move on to the next one. Good luck. Shoot straight. But going back to challenges, I think Maddie nailed, you know, like I said, this is Matt's first time up on this mountain, but he's hunting mule deer as much as anybody. And, uh, but me being up here, um, besides the two that he named, which I think are the top two, is just other pressure. Um, and then getting into bow range of a mature animal, of any animal, is tough. They're, they live out here 365 days a year, if you can believe that. And we're out here a handful of times. So the odds are usually stacked in our favor. But uh, besides that, this mountain is just challenging. It is um, a physical hunt. It requires a lot out of a person. You gotta be in somewhat of good shape if you're trying to, you know, glass basins and go after bucks every day, especially for nine straight days. It, it's a challenge, it's physical. There's um, a lot of steep country, a lot of rocks, a lot of things like that. But uh, I always say, I think, I was telling my buddy Bryce this, I think if a guy's pretty efficient behind the glass and is willing to work hard and work themselves into some opportunities, I think any high country hunt like the one we just did uh, is attainable to people that, you know, can glass and are willing to get after it. And I don't even think, would say that you have to be in the absolute very best shape, but being in some decent shape, which I'm not in like the greatest shape by any means, but I knew I was coming on this hunt. So I did start doing some things about two months ago, like just, you know, literally walking all the stairs at the high school, the local high school with my backpack with like 45 pounds. And sometimes I bumped it up to 60 pounds. Anything helps. Um, so physical, it's definitely a physical hunt. Even though we had horses bring us food in, like Maddie said, we were away from camp most of the time. And that's kind of how I wanted to do this hunt. I've always wanted to do it that way was kind of be mobile. Like Matt said, we glassed, we were camped right at the base of two basins that were absolutely beautiful and they hold deer, obviously 25 deer before, 25 bucks before opening morning. But once the pressure comes in, other hunters, you know, we were there on the weekend, we had a bunch of hikers, fishermen, they come in, those basins kind of get blown up. And if the few deer that do come in are pretty nocturnal, though, you might catch them going back up over the ridge at first light, but they're not sticking around for you to make any sort of plan on them or stalk on them. So being mobile is, I think was key for us. And it really worked because the day after Bryce killed his buck, you know, it was super hot up here. And uh, one of the nice things about having the horses up here was he was able to pack that horse or pack his deer down to the trailhead. And we're not that far. We're like six and a half miles to the trailhead from where our camp was. <clears throat> but he was able to pack his buck, all the meat down and the head down with his horses the next day and uh, get it on the cooler. Here's another tech tip for you. And we do this pretty much on any hunt we ever go on. We always have, depending on what animal we're hunting, bigger or smaller, but typically we usually always have a, at least a 160 quart Yeti cooler in the back of a, one of our trucks. And before we leave town to go on a hunt, we will pack that thing full of ice. And so if something, if it was somebody successful, they can take it back down to the trailhead, drain the water that's in there, so some of the ice is melted, and then get their meat on ice immediately and not have to worry about the rest of the hunt, go back into camp and help. But I'm telling you, if you pack a 160 quart cooler, especially a Yeti cooler with ice, it will last, the Yetis will last 10 to 12 days, no, no doubt about it. So it's a nice thing about having the horses. But that day that those guys, Logan and Bryce packed down to go take the deer, me and Maddie just went and started exploring and we went back into the basin that we killed in just in hopes that there might be a buck that had come back in and there it was pretty dead. And then we spent the last part of the day up on a kind of a newer ridge, um, a newer glassing knob. Glassing what we call the big eye. So glassing all the country you can possibly see around you. And so that requires glassing, you know, sometimes upwards of five to six miles, just in hopes to find something that maybe hasn't been bumped or somebody else isn't hunting. And so that's what we did that night. And uh, we were able to locate a super awesome buck, a definitely mature buck, older buck. And he, we glassed him in some country I'd never even been in. We've, I've looked at it, 
walked by it, but never actually have hunted it. And we glossed this buck in there, like I said, from a long ways away. And so, you know, being mobile, me and Matt made the plan that night that we'd go back in the morning and there's some things that happened. We glassed the buck up and we were all, we were pretty stoked. Me and Matt were, uh, morale was high. It was one of the bigger bucks we'd seen. Probably the biggest buck at the time, right? Yeah, I still think it might be that biggest buck. No, okay. I don't know, dude. So Looking back at some video. You'll understand later. But, so we glassed this buck up and we're stoked. We're like, giant buck, not giant buck, just a beautiful buck. Mature buck, what we were looking for. In some new country that we hadn't seen anybody in or didn't think anybody would be in it. Because it wasn't like the typical basin where most people, most guys come up to hunt. Anyway, so we were stoked. We glassed them about 6.30. Last shooting lights was around 8.15, I believe, that day. And we're making plans on what to do, how to get in there. And then all of a sudden, on the same ridge that that, the, the ridge that led to where that buck was at, we glassed up a hunter. Headed down the ridge, right towards the canyon this buck was in. And that brought us from a pretty high to a pretty low, pretty quick. Sorry, we're walking through some like raspberry bushes above my head. Anyway, so when we saw that hunter, Matt, where did, where did our, uh, where was the morale at after that? So it went from like stoke level, extremely high, making game plans of our spike camp and our stock to son of a gun. Keep your eye on the buck. I'll keep the eye on the hunter and let's just pray that he doesn't drop over that skyline to put a stock on this buck. So it went from just excited, stoked, to anxious and kind of upset, honestly. Like, not even upset that a guy was hunting the deer, but just upset that, like, literally, it just reality smacked us in the face. <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally, that was the first thing that came to my mind when we, when we saw the buck. And then we got the spotter on and confirmed it was a buck we wanted to go after was... In my head, for whatever reason, it was, that buck's not getting hunted. That buck is in a place that I think a lot of guys would overlook or just wouldn't typically hold deer, maybe. And so you're like, sweet. And we even said it that night, this is only the third night of the hunt. And we were, you know, gonna be up here for another four or five days. We, I told Matt, I go, that's our buck, man. That's our target buck. We'll just go and hunt him until we kill him or until we have to get out of here, until they kick us off the mountain. And so I, I love that feeling. I love the feeling of knowing that you have a plan, you have uh, you know, an idea of what you need to do and uh, to hopefully be successful. And then at that point, it just comes down to, hopefully it comes down to what I want it to come down to is our abilities. Our abilities to you know, find the buck again, the ability to make the right decisions on the proper way to go in there without bumping the buck and getting close enough and hopefully getting a shot. I love that thought of, you know, that deer is always going to do deer things and you can't control that. But if you do everything you possibly can and make all the right calls and you get in and kill them, then that's like, hey, we did it, you know? All these years of struggle and, and lessons and learning that, that one came together. And so when you see the guy, it's like, okay, that's just another wrinkle in it. And like Matt said, you know, you're hoping that that guy's going after a different buck or whatever have you. So we made the decision that that night, we're like, we will wake up in the morning, come right back to the same glassing point. And if we can lo relocate that buck, that tells us that that guy probably didn't go in there that night and and you know, bump them or kill them. And so we woke up that night or the next morning and uh, went to the glassing knob and we couldn't find him at first, but sure enough, the sun came up and he was just bedded in there in some thick brush and he stood up. And uh, as soon as we identified it, it was the big buck we wanted to go after. It was high five smiles, but okay, now there's a lot of work in front of us. Because basically what we had planned on doing was if we could relocate the buck, we were going to have to relocate. We were going to have to leave spike camp or main camp. And so Bryce and Logan came in 
uh, super late that night that we had glassed him. Um, and so we told him, we were like, hey, here's our plan. If we find that buck in the morning, we're gonna load our bags and we're just gonna go spike out for the rest of the hunt until we leave or until we kill him. And so they were trying to decide what they want, needed to do to help us, if they needed to relocate camp or if they could help us from where they were. Anyway, so we reloc relocated the buck and man, I can tell you, we made a plan, looked at our Onyx over and over and over, tried to decide the best place, not just to get, but like to camp because as the crow flies, this buck was like two and a half, three miles away. On the trail, we're bushwhacking, it ended up being, from when we left main camp to when we set camp, it was eight miles, I believe. Is that right, Matt? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't just a little jump hop and a skip. It was a, it was an all day journey. And I mean, Casey and I got really good this trip of hiking in the heat of the day, doing these <laughs> dead hikes. For whatever reason, that's when we chose to do all the hiking was the heat of the day. So, found the buck, made a plan, went and loaded our bags and basically took off. And uh, our plan was we left camp around 1130 and we wanted to be up on the ridge close to where we had seen the buck around four or five. And man, we, we booked it. We got down, it was all downhill until the last mile and a half or two. And that was a climb. And, but we did it and got there at like 2.30, set camp, and then went, you know, the buck was another mile or so from there, mile and a half. So we went in and, and I don't want to ruin the movie for you or the, the, the video. It's going to come out. But I won't tell you the outcome, but what I'll tell you is it's really, really neat when you have three of your buddies, Maddie, Logie, and Bryce, and you know, me and Matt had kind of set the cornerstone for the plan the night before, but you know, when Bryce and Logan got into camp, they came up with us to the glassy knob and saw the buck, and we all just came together and made a plan like what would be very best, and how, how would it be possible to kill this deer? Because, you know, I think of this all the time, so <laughs> every time I'm bow hunting, it's either one or two things. It's either after a couple days, I don't care what you're hunting, if it's elk, deer, antelope. But you're going out in the mountains with this stick and string with some hopefully straight arrows. And after getting your butt kicked for a few days, you're like, is this even possible to get within range of one of these things and make a good shot? Like, sometimes it does, it feels impossible. Like, this is never gonna happen. But other times, it's like, man, that was easy. That worked out. So anyway, what I want to say was, it was really cool that we all came together and we made a plan. Uh, according to everybody's opinions and thoughts, we kind of binded them all together. We came up with the best plan we could as a team. And I'm telling you what, it worked. It worked almost too well. And uh, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. But that's a, one of the things I take away from this hunt is, and you're gonna go through, and you guys know me, if you watch our videos long enough, followed our channel, listen to these podcasts, I like to relate a lot of things I learn out in the woods, the things in my life, because honestly, looking back as a young boy and my dad taking me out, either on a fishing trip, a scouting trip, hunting trip, whatever it might be, some of the most important valuable lessons I've ever learned in my life have been just that, out in the mountains. And maybe it's, you know, something pertaining to hunting, but at the end of the day, I always relate that to something in my life as well. And that's what I wanna say is, no matter what you're doing, if you're out hunting, trying to grow a business, start trying to start a business, working at a company, trying to raise a family, trying to start a family, whatever it might be, there's always gonna be roadblocks. There's gonna be roadblocks, things that try to stop your success moving forward. There's gonna be people that tell you you can't do it. There's gonna be people that run in front of you in the ridge, and then you're gonna have people that come and talk to you. But I wanna relate this to just what life is, man. Roadblocks, struggles, it's all part of it. And that's what this hunt was, was we knew going in the roadblocks we were gonna have. There were some unforeseen roadblocks that we, we went through, which will happen. But you know, you worked as, we worked as a team. We did our very best with the knowledge that we have and, and the abilities we had. And, we walk away, literally walking out of the mountains right now, maybe a half a mile from our truck with all those 
experiences, those learning experiences really. And I always say like, hopefully those make me a better hunter. You know, hopefully the next time I'm in, I'm in the woods, I'm a little, a little quieter, a little more stealth, a better shot, whatever it might be. But also, you know, I'm leaving this hunt, headed home tonight and uh, see my family tomorrow. And it's mine and my wife's 19th anniversary tomorrow. And I always hope that I can take these learning experiences I've learned out in the, here in the woods and apply them to my life as, a, as a, a man, as a father, as a husband, as a friend, a business partner. Hopefully I can be a better person because of it. Because I can really tell you that all those stuff that we just talked about relates to you as a person as well. So any closing remarks, Maddie? No, man, I think you hit the nail on the head. And like, one last thing I kind of want to leave people with, because if this comes out before majority of the hunting season starts archery, I think the two most important things that guys who kill big deer year after year have in common would be patience and persistence. So that's kind of my closing remarks. Like, if, if you're really gonna get after it and try and be the most efficient hunter in the woods, top of your list needs to be patience and persistence. And uh, I hope you guys learned something from the short little podcast while we're hiking out. And I hope you guys get stoked and kind of this lights a fire under you to get out there with family and friends and make some memories. So that's my closing remarks, I guess. Yeah. I love the thought that, you know, the woods are our playground if we choose them to be. If it's hunting or fishing or mountain biking or just a picnic with your family, like the woods are a freaking amazing place to escape with the people you love, especially, you know, with the turmoil and the craziness that goes on in the world, man. Even if you don't have a tag in your pocket, get out, breathe this freaking fresh air, listen to that creek running beside the trail, watch that sunset, find a big buck if you have time. But guys, seriously, we have always, always said, but we really mean it. We can't do any of this without your guys' support. We appreciate you listening to the podcast, watching the videos, following us on social media, buying some merch at our website. Like, we'll never be able to repay you guys for allowing us to hopefully bring you some entertainment, some laughs, some tears, whatever it might be. And but hopefully, we uh, we get you guys excited about getting out and doing this yourself people you love the most so we are going to sign off here almost to the truck and uh just tell you guys this season we don't even have a name for it i don't think yet we thought about best season yet five but man we've done that four times we are going to showcase this season a little differently than we have in years past just off feedback from you guys and we've done some polls you know on our youtube and some of our old social media, but we hope you enjoy it. We know that you will enjoy this one because it's done. We know what we captured. Um, just a really special, fun hunt with a lot of cool, cool experiences. And guys, moving forward, I can tell you right now, hopefully this is, comes out before this, but uh, a week from today, me and Matty Ice, Logie, and Eric Chester are flying to Alaska to go do a caribou hunt. So this probably has been, in my opinion, you know, I look forward to every season, thankful for every season and uh, any chance we get. But man, I really love the list of adventures we have in front of us this year and love the way we're going to show it. So I think you guys are going to enjoy it. But anyways, can't wait to show you guys all this footage. In the meantime, hopefully you guys are getting ready for your guys' first hunt. Or if you've been out on your first hunt, hopefully you've found some successes already. But Guys, we love you. We can't thank you enough. Uh, I am, my heart's full. And it usually is after you hike the last nine days and you're tired and the truck is within earshot. So uh, thanks guys, we appreciate it. Till next time. Give him a diddle, Matt, a doodle. Oh yeah, R real quick though. If you liked this um, style of podcast on the trail with Hush, leave a comment or a like and uh, let us know if you want more of these live updates from the trail this season and uh like casey said till next time adios guys
<laughs> the acoustics up in this canyon are unbelievable. Alrighty, cut.